This is a major portion of scripture from which we learn many biblical principles of music. Now we've just spent 15 weeks looking at the qualifications for biblical music. We've looked at its origin in the character and nature of God. We've looked at its source, its purpose, the fact that music is a major weapon in the great spiritual war, the long war against God. We've looked at the musical capabilities of Satan and his demons. We've looked at the character qualities of music that glorifies God versus the character qualities of music that glorifies the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons. We've looked at the physical impact that music makes on our minds and bodies, emotions, wills, and spiritual growth, either for good or for evil. We've looked briefly at the New Testament discussion of music and the controlling principles in the New Testament. On the positive side, we saw that there are two places in the New Testament that tell us about a variety of types of music that are appropriate for worship in the church. We saw that the Apostle Paul breaks those down for us in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, and Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And we had a wonderful discussion on that and pointed out that it would be very hard to find uh, Christian acid rock or Christian punk rock to fit into one of those categories of psalms or hymns or spiritual songs. Then we moved on to a study of biblical poetry and how it relates to the principles of biblically sound music. Most people don't get it, but biblically in, biblical inspiration extends to the linguistic structures and forms, including the music and poetry of Scripture, as well as to the exact words, the exact letters, even the exact parts of letters, like the jot and the tittle, the yod and the tittle little foot off the side of some of the letters. We learned that between one-third and one-half of the Hebrew Old Testament is written in a Hebrew poetic style that was designed to be set to music just as it stands. Between one-third and one-half of your Old Testament is in Hebrew poetic form. That should boggle the mind. I hope it does. We all know that at least one-third of the Old Testament is prophetic. That makes prophecy, obviously, very highly imperative for the study in light of current world events. But very few people have ever wondered why God would choose Hebrew poetry and music to express at least one-third or more of his revelation to mankind, just like he made one-third of the Old Testament prophetic. We talked about the question, why did the King James translators choose not to translate Hebrew poetry into English poetry? And we gave the answer, there's no legitimate way that Hebrew poetic form can be literally translated into English poetic form and still retain the formal equivalence translation, that means a word-for-word -word translation, which was sought after by the King James translators. Formal equivalence means that you are literally translating and not paraphrasing the translation like a lot of non the modern non-Bibles. That was a great discussion. We talked about how many of the stories in the Bible appear in both narrative and poetic sections and forms. For example, the narrative of Barak and Deborah in Judges 4 is written in prose, but the song of Deborah telling the same events, the song of Deborah and Barak in Judges 5, the very next chapter is Hebrew poetry, which was meant to be sung. They record exactly the same events, one chapter after another. That's exactly like what we've been studying here in Exodus chapter 14 and 15. In the same way, we can compare Exodus 14, where it is written in prose, it's a narrative, where Pharaoh and the Egyptians are drowned in the Red Sea, compared with chapter 15, where the Song of Moses describes the exact same event. It's written in Hebrew poetic form, meant to be sung. In fact, it's clear from the text that it was sung by Moses and the congregation of Israel, and that's why the message today is entitled The Biggest Choir and Stage Show in History, Part 1. I gave you illustrations of how we moved on, uh, move, how we are moved when scripture is set to music, especially great music, such as in Handel's Messiah, or Mendelssohn's Oratorio Elijah, or Bach's St. Matthew's Passion. And certainly the hymns that we sing in church every week, if theologically accurate and set to Christ honoring music, are fully appropriate. I gave you multiple illustrations as to how non inspired poetry can express biblical truth without being inspired. 
just like my non-inspired sermons, will hopefully express and cause you to understand truth. Poetry like music, and especially when they're combined, is a compact way of stating incredibly deep truth that reaches not only the mind, but also the emotions and the heart with poignant, graceful, and precise language. That is the reason that so many of the great and lasting hymns have such powerful impact on the hearers. They express biblical truth with language that is both appropriate and powerful with appropriate musical forms that cement the language inside the soul of the listener. That is also why some of the great hymns of the faith have lasted for centuries and why contemporary Christian music is generally rubbish and usually becomes obsolete within a few years of its composition. We notice that poetry is often difficult because poetic language is frequently indirect, veiled in allegory, compact, terse, uniquely combines things that we normally never blend or associate together, and simultaneously moves our emotions as well as our minds. And musical poetry, remember more than the third of the Bible of the Old Testament is written in that, musical poetry is even more powerful than poetry that is only spoken. The Apostle Paul speaks of some portions of Scripture as milk, and other portions as meat, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, and so on. A great deal of the musical and poetic parts of the Bible are difficult. They fall into the category of meat rather than milk, particularly the musical and poetic section of the Old Testament prophets. Last week I explained that there are at least four reasons for understanding the relationship between music and poetry. First, most of you only read English. I think that very few of you read Hebrew and Greek, so you need to understand what's going on when you read between one-third and one-half of the Old Testament. Number two, there are striking differences between Hebrew and English poetry that cannot be adequately reconciled. English translators cannot translate biblical poetry into Shakespearean poetic form by the formal equivalence method. Formal equivalence uh, prose produces the very best and the very most accurate and most faithful translation. Shakespearean English language poetry would not have accomplished that goal in 1611. The translators chose right when they chose to translate it as prose. Number three, the translators were translators, not poets. The King James Version was made at the pinnacle of the most exquisite English language poetry at yet then. When the greatest English poet to that day, Shakespeare, and possibly the greatest English poet ever to live, was still alive. To try to place difficult Hebrew poetry into English language poetry without even knowing at the time the rules of Hebrew poetry would have been both arrogant and absurd. The King James translators were incredible scholars, but they were not poets. Number four, the modern translators who try to make English poetry equi equivalence translations to biblical Hebrew poetry must make a choice. Are they going to be faithful, accurate, and precise translators, or are they going to be very bad poets proudly waving their poetic rags in public. And as you know, some of those modern translators and musicians have obviously chosen to be very bad poets and very bad musicians. That brought us to the issue raised by having divinely inspired poetry and music in the Bible. Why did God use so much Hebrew poetry and Hebrew music in the Bible, especially since it's so hard to translate into other languages? Good question, but there's some very clear answers. Number one, first, God expects us to energetically study His Word. That includes, especially for those called to be pastors and teachers, studying it in the original languages. Using the terse, compact structures and forms of Hebrew poetry is, as God gave us, a beautifully wrapped gift. But we have to unwrap the gift and follow the instructions for workable assembly. God wants us to be diligent in studying, interacting with, and expounding His Word to others. So I have a great burden and responsibility to do that. But you do too, because there are so many English language helps that explain exactly what I have summarized for you in these messages. You can go out and get them and use them and understand them. Many, many, many of them in English language. Some of you have begun to start a theological library. You've begun to start a, a, a study library. Just begin with Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Finds expository dictionaries and New Testament words and Old Testament words. There are multiple different resources out there that will help you understand exactly what I am telling and not making it up, but you can check it out yourself. Second, certain portions of Scripture are called milk. They're easy to digest spiritually. And other portions are called meat. That's the more difficult doctrines of Scripture. English prose rather than English poetry is more suited for accomplishing the purpose of precisely communicating difficult doctrine through formal equivalence in the English language. Third, 
poetic structure, which is necessary for musical structure, plus form and other elements, communicate truth in a unique way. Just as looking at a diamond from different angles and under different lights bring out, brings out its great beauty. English language poetry cannot adequately reflect this grouping of insights and remain faithful to formal equivalency, but English prose can. And that's why it is also appropriate for us to have great hymns and Christian music that carry sound doctrine. Fourth, and as I told you last week, I think this is very important, God clearly wants us to view the biblical Hebrew poetic sections as being equal in value to the prophetic sections of scripture since he dedicated so much, if not more space, to expressing himself in poetry. There are many biblical prophecy freaks, but how many biblical poetry freaks do you know? Therefore, pastors and Bible teachers need to spend a great deal of time learning how to mine the depths of biblical poetry for exposition to English-speaking audiences. Fifth, Hebrew poetry, to which the ancient Hebrew music was set, gives us a beautiful insight into the nature and character of God. Clearly, God is not only a musical being in Scripture, but He is a beautiful poetic being as well. The book of Zephaniah tells us that God Himself sings over us with joy. But then He gives us all this poetry as well. The extensive use of Hebrew poetry in the Old Testament reveals this in an astounding manner. Number six. By divine command, Scripture is to be translated into all the languages of the earth. Mark 16, 15, Acts 1, 8. Each language, not just English, has a different linguistic structure, although some are similar. If you're going to carry the gospel to other countries, you've got to be able to translate it into their languages. That's what those verses are about. You should be my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem and Judea, but you're going to be my witnesses to the uttermost parts of the earth. You're going to have to speak the languages. You're going to have to get the scripture into the languages. That's a command for translation. We must, we must go back and learn what God said to them, how he expressed himself to ancient Israel in the venue, language, culture, and linguistic forms that most perfectly expressed himself to those people. We have to go back and learn what God said to them. Rather than trying to force fit his revelation into a shape that is pleasing to carnal American Christians. God gave major portions of the Old Testament poetic form to music because poetry is generally a potent tool for memorization, and God wanted them and us to learn his word. Psalm 119, 9 through 11 makes that very clear. For example, the entire 119 Psalm uses the poetic device of arranging the entire Psalm according to the Hebrew alphabet in groups of eight verses that each begin with a subsequent letter of the Hebrew alphabet. This is poetically significant because Psalm 119 is principally focused on what topic? The Word of God. God ties poetry to the proclamation of the Word of God. He ties poetry to the memorization of the Word of God. He ties poetry to the living out in the practical Christian life of the Word of God. That brings us to today. The biggest choir and stage show in history, part one. So with that in mind, we begin to look at the Song of Moses to apply the principles that we've been studying for the last 15 weeks. Let me just read for you the first three verses once again. Listen to them carefully because there's some incredible clues in these first three verses. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he is become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. You know, that's certainly not the God of the liberals today. But here's a declaration that the Lord, Jehovah, it's all capital. It's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital E. That's the name Yahweh, or Jehovah, in the Old Testament. Yahweh! is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. Not a bunch of lily-livered, weak-kneed pacifists dancing around that song. So let's look at some things here. Number one, the first thing to notice is that this music 
is corporate or congregational. Corporate or congregational. In other words, it is a musical expression of worship showing the unity of God's people. It's not merely a personal expression. It's not a solo where only one person performs and everybody else listens. With at least two million and possibly as many as six million people singing, this was the biggest choir in history. And with Miriam and the other women dancing with tambourines, it was also the biggest stage show in history. But really, you know, that's nothing. Because it's going to be dwarfed by the songs of the redeemed in eternity as they gather around the throne of God as revealed in the book of Revelation. Corporate or congregational worship is involved here. Number two. The second thing to notice is that this music is not only about the Lord, it was sung to the Lord. Did you notice that in the opening verse? Did you notice that? It's clearly stated in verse 1. Even at first glance, the content of the song obviously reflects the work, the character, and the acts of God, but notice well, it has a direct and a specific audience. It says it was sung unto the Lord. It was not sung to make people feel warm and fuzzy, which is a lot of so-called Christian contemporary music today. It was not sung to meet a personal emotional need. It was not sung to get paid for performance. It was not sung for personal recognition or as part of a contest. Who's the winner? It was not sung to get the excess energy and wheels out of the kids. It was not sung to show off talent of the worship team and the praise band. It was not sung in a mindless New Age trance hoping for a personal encounter with God out there somewhere. There was a congregation of at least six million singers singing to an audience of one. Almighty God was the principal audience. People and singers and angels were only incidental to the audience. It was sung unto the Lord. He was the audience. And he was pleased. I think this is one of the most important missing elements in the thoughts of most of us when we sing our hymns. We've sung a couple of hymns this morning so far. When was the last time you thought this thought crossed your mind? I'm singing this to God with all of my heart and soul and being. I'm not singing to make myself feel good. I'm not singing to impress other people. I'm singing to God. I hope you think that sometimes. God is my audience. Now, I'm going to be blunt for a couple of minutes here. So please bear with me. Let me be blunt. This is also one of the reasons why some of you are sinning greatly when you are late and miss the first half of the worship service. Did you get that? It's the reason why some of you are sinning greatly when you are late and miss the first half of the service of worship when we sing to the Lord. You are directly and deliberately rejecting 50% of the worship that God has commanded you to perform. Let me say it again so that you don't miss my point. I'm talking directly to some of you who are always late to the 11 o'clock morning worship service, even though you have no problem making it to your jobs on time at a much earlier hour. I think that this responsibility of singing to the Lord, not merely for our own enjoyment, is one of the most important missing elements in the thoughts of most of us when we sing our hymns. This is also one of the reasons why some of you are sinning greatly when you are late and miss the first half of the service of worship when we sing to the Lord because you're rejecting 50% of worship that God has commanded you to perform. 
not just you're missing out, but God has commanded you to do this. Someday you will have to stand before Christ and give an account for your sloth and indolence in refusing to worship Him with one of the principal elements that He has ordained for divine worship. I'm going to go out here on a limb for just a minute. Some time ago, there was a man in this church who was habitually and deliberately late to every morning worship service. I discussed this with him repeatedly. He was always on time to work, but he thought he had a really spiritual reason for being late and for missing the corporate element of worship, that is, the music. Now he admitted to me also on the side that, um, you know, he really didn't want to fellowship with some of the folks here and join with them in doing that because of what he thought this church had done to Dr. McIntyre. But he used that as a secondary excuse. Remember people, music is the corporate element of worship where you are actually personally participating in the worship of Almighty God, where you are corporately addressing Him with music and words. You're not just listening to somebody else. You're personally participating. You don't personally participate in the welcome or in the scripture reading or in the choir numbers each week unless you're in the choir, the announcements, the time when I read the Bible text of the day and so on. The principal corporate element in which you personally participate in the worship is the singing of the hymns. So let me go back for a moment to our little tardy man. So what was that late guy's really spiritual reason for being late? And he thought this was going to impress me. I'll tell you what he said. He said he wanted to listen to my father on the radio. And he actually said to me, you wouldn't want me to miss that, would you? Like, uh -huh, I've got you there. You wouldn't want me to miss your dad. I mean, he's a great Bible teacher. That's true. He's a great Bible teacher. You wouldn't want me to miss him, would you? So I told him, look. You can still be on time, drive to the church on time, listen to my dad in the parking lot on your car radio instead of listening to my dad at home and then driving to the church. If he had done that, he would have been on time because my dad's radio broadcast ends at two minutes before 11 a.m. But he stubbornly refused. Some of you probably know who I'm talking about. God took him home while he was still a young man. I believe that his stubborn refusal to participate in the corporate worship of the church was at least one element why he died young. I may be wrong, but I suspect that. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. Let me step on a few other toes while I'm at it. The way in the, that is in the context, by the way, of paying the pastor. The immediate preceding verse says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate, that's a word that means share, unto him that teacheth in all good things. Galatians 6, 6. I'm aware that some of you have never personally donated a nickel of your own money to the pastor's salary fund. Now, I, I don't need it because other people are donating and I'm getting paid. But you're the one that's losing. You have never personally donated a nickel of your own money. Maybe you say, well, you know, another relative of mine does it for me. But you've never donated a nickel of your own money. Okay, okay, let me let stop meddling, get back to music as corporate worship and instead of being late. late. Now, now, would I be would surprised, I be surprised if, if some of you who stubbornly refuse to participate in corporate worship, worship which is highlighted by the music, would I be surprised if some of you died? Mm, no, I wouldn't be surprised. A warning, don't put God on the test just to see if it will happen. Don't say to yourself, ha ha, I'll keep on doing it and prove the silly pastor is wrong. 
Deuteronomy 6.16, Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. Matthew 4.7, Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Does God kill people for testing him? Yes. Remember Ananias and Sapphira, Acts 5.9, Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. And she dropped dead. Paul reminds us of this in his example from the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 10.9 Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. God can choose some very unpleasant ways for you to die. So back to our text, Exodus 15.1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. So now the third thing to notice about this music, which it is, this chapter is musical, is the repetition of the phrase, unto the Lord, with both the noun and verbal forms of song and sing. Notice something. Emphasis is placed both on the music and the words because we find song and sing and in between it says, and they spake. That means to talk. So there's an emphasis both on the music and the words because it also uses the word spake. The union of both appropriate music and words is the highest form, the highest combination of corporate worship to God. Let me say it again because it's important. The union of both appropriate music and words is the highest combination of corporate worship to God. Number four, I hope you're taking notes. That's why those papers are in your bulletins. The fourth thing to notice is that the music gives God all the praise and the glory and makes no claim for participating in the victory. It gives God all the praise and glory and makes no claim for participating in the victory. God did it. He hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. In that context, it is also important to notice that the opening line is a statement of the theme of the song. What is the theme of the song? Here is what Almighty God did. That's the theme. Here's what Almighty God did, not what we did, not how we managed to seek out, not how we were so smart, not how we walked forward and we walked by faith. It was what God did. Dear people, and they're singing this to God. Oh God, you are mighty. Oh God, you did this. Not, oh God, I was down here with my good old free will and you made this offer and I thought to myself, well, should I do this? Is it for my benefit? It's not for my benefit. You're sitting up there in heaven biting your teeth wondering if I'm going to choose right. No. Oh God, here is what you did. We give you humble praise and thanksgiving and you showed your mighty, almighty power. You demonstrated yourself strong on our behalf and we did not deserve it, but you gave it to us anyway. And we sing it to him, not merely about him. We give him praise and thanksgiving by the way in which we sing and with the attitudes with which we sing. Now, of course, God knows precisely what he did. He did it. But it brings him glory and pleasure to hear his creatures sing about it to him with wonder and thanksgiving in their heart. The fifth thing to notice is that corporate worship does not exclude the personal application of the worship. Corporate worship does not exclude the personal application of the worship. Five personal pronouns are used in the opening line of the song. Verse 2, the Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. 
He is my God. I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. That's actually six. I left out that last I. Six in one verse. The sixth thing that we see is the threefold reason, the threefold reason that personal application is required in corporate worship. You don't just do it mindlessly. There will be personal application as you sing to God. Although you're describing Him in His presence, there is personal application. We see that here. And there's a threefold reason. God provides the following three personal blessings to each believer when we corporately worship Him this way. Number one, it says, He is my strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Have you ever stopped to consider that music is part of waiting upon the Lord? Not just, you know, I wish you'd get around to it kind of waiting, but where you are serving that kind of waiting as well. He is our strength. The second thing it says, the Lord is my song. Song reflects joy and praise and worship. And then perhaps most importantly here in that verse, and he is become my salvation. Strength, song, salvation. Easy to remember, they all begin with an S. This results when we worship God correctly in this way and corporately as well as individually in our own quiet times. It results in a daily personal relationship. Notice the, the word habitation here. I will prepare him an habitation. That's personal relationship. He lives with us. Now the intergenerational nature of these three blessings is seen in the phrase, My Father's God. There's a lot in my verse. Verse 2 is packing it in. It's intergenerational. He is my Father's God. We stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. None of us is an island. You know the poem by John Donne. Uh, no man is an island. We need one another in the context of family. Remember, the Jews really were all family, biologically related one to another. You need to connect firmly with your spiritual family in corporate worship. And by doing so, you exalt God. That is the final phrase in that verse. And I will exalt Him. When you are joining together, you are connecting firmly with your spiritual family. When you are corporately at worship in singing, music, praising Almighty God, you are exalting God in the way that He requires. The seventh thing to see is the reason for the theme. The, remember the theme was the overthrow of Pharaoh in the sea, is because of a specific and precise character quality of God. That character quality is specifically tied to the name Jehovah. I mentioned this in passing just a moment ago, but think about it for a moment. Verse 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now, although we don't usually associate God with war, it's very specifically stated in this verse. The reason we don't usually associate him with war is because in most human experience, war comes as a result of the sinful condition of man. War comes as a result of greed and lust and anger and covetousness and pride and envy and land-grabbing expansionism and arrogant bullying and peer pressure and unwise alliances and a host of other carnal reasons. Augustine talked about a just war, waging a just war, that is, a war for righteous reasons. Did you ever stop to consider all of God's wars are just wars? They are all waged for righteous reasons. Our text is a point in fact. Pharaoh had refused and had rejected all of God's offers of peace. Pharaoh had refused to obey God and let Israel go. Pharaoh had refused to bend under the mighty hand of God in the ten plagues. And so God had a war with Pharaoh, and he killed all of Pharaoh's army. 
All of the divinely directed wars of God in the Old Testament were based on the principle of the righteous judgment of God on the wicked and the perverted civilizations who had rejected the God of creation. We see another dramatic illustration of God as a man of war in the book of Revelation in chapter 19. That's where our Lord Jesus Christ is in view. Usually we think of Christ as gentle and meek and mild, but Jesus Christ is also a man of war. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies, that's war for our fair folks, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is a man of war, and he judges righteous judgment. And he makes war in righteousness against the rebels of earth who have rejected God's offer of grace and salvation. We normally associate the name Jehovah, that's L-O-R-D, all capital letters, with his eternal being, no beginning and no end. And it is a form of the verb to be uh, in the Old Testament. Or we connect it with the fact that he is a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God, and that also is true. But here in our text, the name Yahweh is a statement of his righteous nation as a warrior for justice and truth. The character and nature of God is war against all unrighteousness. There are no shadows of unrighteousness in his being. But notice something else here in our verses. God is not only a righteous warrior, he's an omnipotent warrior. Look at how many times that fact is stated in this song of Moses. Now, I'm only citing the verses that say what God did, not just the results of what God did. I'm just going to give you the verses that say what he did. They all relate to war. They all relate to victory over an enemy. They all relate to a fight. And they all relate to a God who guarantees he's going to win. I'll just read those phrases out of here. Verse 1, Verse he hath triumphed, triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown in the sea. Verse 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Verse 4, Pharaoh's chariots and oath hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains are drowned in the Red Sea. Verse 6, thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Verse 7, in thy greatness and thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sendest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. Verse 8, with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together, the floods stood upright as a heap, the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. Verse 10, thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. Verse 11, who is like thee, O Lord, among the gods, doing wonders. Verse 12, thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Verse 16, by the greatness of thine arm, they shall be still as stone. Verse 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Verse 19, the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. Verse 21, and Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Amen. Our time is up. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it's gone forth today. That you might receive the honor and the glory and the praise. For you are Almighty God. You are Yahweh. The covenant-keeping God, the eternal God, but you are also God who is the Lord, our man of war. You are gracious God, and you offer us salvation. You have made your peace offering. You have sent your peace child. 
You have sent your Son, who died in our place on Calvary's cross and rose again. You've given to us, as believers, the responsibility of telling others about that. But the day will come, perhaps soon, when this earth, which has rejected your offer of peace and grace, which has refused, as Pharaoh did, to fall before your throne in humble worship and thanksgiving, the day will come when those whom you have placed to be your witnesses on earth will be taken up and your wrath will begin. Father, help us to understand the prophetic future as beautifully portrayed in the poetic song here and in other portions of the Old Testament scriptures. Help us to understand who you are. Help us not to trivialize you. Help us to sing to you for you are worthy. Father, once again, we thank you for your word. We pray that you will cause it to plow deeply into our hearts and change our way of thinking, our attitudes, our speech, our lives, that truly we might bring glory to you, the God of the universe, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who bore our sins at Calvary and rose from the dead, guaranteeing us eternal life. That we might have your compassion and heart for those who are lost. That they also might hear and believe and receive the joy of deliverance, as Moses and the children of Israel did. The joy of deliverance, of salvation. Not merely from temporal problems like Moses and the Israelites experienced, but deliverance for all of eternity. Thank you again for your word. Bless it to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 607, Close to Thee. 607, let's stand to sing.